Um, and I'm myself a first generation college uh, student, uh, well, in the past. Um, and so and I've also been thinking about uh, what Dr. Marcus was saying about translating Shasha today, you know, something like, like what kind of American audience would be receptive to the texts of, uh, of uh, uh, Shasha. Um, and, you know, when, when you were speaking yesterday, I was, I was thinking about Friedrich Schleiermacher, uh, who with Goethe is kind of a translation theorist in the 19th century. And um, my, my sense is that what we need is a kind of a a, strategy, a translation strategy of domestication, kind of domesticating uh, Shasha for um, our American uh, audience. And so um, I've been thinking about the Mediterranean and the American myth in Shasha as a cornerstone um, of a word, liter word literature pedagogy that explores the regional, national, transnational or transcultural um, and Mediterranean dimensions of Shasha's uh, texts. And so my intention today is to show how Shasha engages in a dense network of interconnected literary and cultural contexts that gravitate around uh, the Sicily um, and that kind of show up uh, in, my, in my classes. So I've taught a number of texts by Shasha uh, to, uh, to my undergrads, um, obviously Il Consiglio d'Egitto, uh, Ciascuno il Suo, uh, Il Giorno della Civetta, uh, e Il Mare Color del Vino. And um, I want to start by talking about The Day of the Owl, a text that I taught and mined the date here in 2019. Uh, in an upper-level post-World War II European literature course for English majors. The novel was greeted by students with a mix of skepticism, uh, curiosity, and cautious optimism. Um, and so the first thing that came, came up was obviously the nature of the relationship between the work of uh, Captain Bellodi and the image of Shakespeare's owl. Uh, right, and Henry VI evoked in the epigraph, and you may recall Shakespeare's quote, like the owl by day, if he arise, be mocked and wondered at. So a powerful image, obviously, of an eternal animal, which surprisingly appears during the day, and, you know, I, I see Amara, uh, Amara Lacus's night bird as a reference to, uh, to obviously, to, to, to the night owl. Um, and uh, the students kind of understood Shasha's strategy. The protagonist Bellodi, a former partigiano who had fought fascism before the mafia, appears as the nocturnal owl in Shakespeare's texts, which obviously uh, presenting itself during the day uh, subverts social norms um, and arouses the mixture of bewilderment, bewilderment and derision in the other characters of the novel. Um, and so I kind of explained to my students the, the kind of total and totalitarian power of the Mafia within Shasha's novel. Um, and obviously to a student population that, as, as we have explored yesterday and this morning, often knows the Mafia only through the filter of American cinematography. And so Shasha's text prompted in students the following question. So what's the relationship between Mafia and uh, the Mafia and, 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 and fascism. And the question was not one of historical interactions, right, du during the, uh, the, the Ventennio, right? Is there a Mafia ideology? And to what, according to what social and political dynamics does, does fascism appear as organized crime intent on subduing the economic power of the state? Um, and I have to say, what, what followed was a very animated uh, uh, discussion and the kind of students kind of recognized the kind of structural isomorphism between mafia, the mafia and, uh, and, and, and fascism, uh, the mafia um, with its systematic uh, corruption that tries to kind of propose itself as a substitute to the state, as an alternative to the state. And I want to go back to the date that I mentioned before, and that is 2019, right? And I don't present mafia, uh, I don't present Shasha as a mafiologo, obviously. Um, but 
do students make the connection um, between American fas fascism under Trump and his mobster tactics, and speaking about judges, and his appointment of Supreme Court judges? So teaching Shasha in the age of Trump um, kind of updates Shasha in many ways. And often, and, and this is what I've been doing since 2016, um, I my research is basically in anti-fascist intellectuals, and it never really dawned upon me um, until 2016. And so I have started integrating my teaching, for instance, of European modernism, um, emphasizing the kind of anti-fascist uh, thrust. And so I, I explained to students what fascism is, and I use uh, Umberto Eco, I use uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, the origin of totalitarianism, and my examples are usually fr are from German Nazis, Italian fascists, um, Soviet Russia, and I never mention Trump, but um, they put the kind of connections together once we talk about you know fascism, and it's like, oh, this sounds familiar, and oddly, um, uh, and, and, and sadly and tragically um, relevant. And so Shasha kind of helps me in that kind of um, post-2016 pedagogy. And um, another text that I, um, that I enjoy teaching is the Council of Egypt, uh, which obviously to American undergrads requires a historical contextualization uh, of, of Sicily within an often ignored social, cultural, and political uh, geography. Um, and obviously, this is not new uh, to any of us, uh, but it is to my students when I place Sicily in the context of an Arab and Islamic uh, Mediterranean. Um, and that is a position that piques uh, students' uh, uh, interest. And I take this opportunity to remind students that for Shasha, um, the golden age of Islamic arts and sciences that brought the island into the orbit of the Arab Mediterranean uh, represented for Sicily, at least in the eyes of, uh, of, of uh, Shasha, a time of economic prosperity, technological, scientific, and artistic innovation, as well as a period of relative social uh, stability. And so Sicily's Islamic history then suggests an alternative cultural geography that restores the island's position to the center of a Mediterranean space of aesthetic, political, and religious mediations. Um, and in many ways, it's, it kind of surprises them, right, that Sicily um, is often seen as the periphery, right? And with these new coordinates, I tell them, well, well, it's actually not simply geographically the biggest island in the Mediterranean, but the centrality, um, again, is not simply geographical but also cultural and, um, and, and, and political, if you, uh, if you will. Um, and, uh, and they often very much enjoy uh, La Minsonia Saracina, the Saracen lie of Abbot Vella, who produces the two false historical documents that obviously rewrite the history, uh, shifting the balance of power in the island. And so we talk about the kind of the social constructedness of political power um, and how it is often a very textual affair. And I invite them to think about what we do as readers of texts, um, how we ourselves kind of manipulate power and how power is manipulated through uh, the, the, well, today, the finding and the losing of, of, uh, of, of texts. Um, and what often comes up is Shasha's kind of reflection on Sicily and the um, and the Enlightenment, like the European Enlightenment, uh, French, but also uh, Italian, and that according to Shasha, kind of insufficiently permeated um, the um, kind of Sicilian uh, Sicilian history, and what often follows, and, I, and I'm really fascinated by this, is the students kind of pick up on the difference between the European Enlightenment and the American Enlightenment, right? And these are two very different things. Um, and, and often I say, you know, 
I, I tend to think of ourselves as Europeans as sons and daughters of the French Revolution, um, and Americans are often sons and daughters of the American Revolution, right? And so the French and American Revolution uh, that obviously leads to a very different kind of outcome, especially when in the novel we talk about um, capital punishment, right? La pena di morte with Beccaria, Shasha's position um, that again kind of to students not accustomed to thinking in those terms can be, um, I think, surprising, but also uh, pedagogically um, uh, very important. Um, another text that um, is um, in many ways easy to teach uh, is uh, The Wine Dark Sea, right, with the kind of short stories. Um, and I usually have to start with an explanation of the Homeric epithet of epi oinopoponton, right? What does it mean? Uh, and why Sicily um, and the ancient Greek heritage in, uh, in, 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 in Sicily. Um, and in the Wine Dark Sea, obviously, uh, in, in the short story, they're the travelers on the train to Sicily and, and they meet this young woman who is a devout follower of San Calogero, patron saint of San Nisima. And as the narrator emphasizes, author of many miracles, right? There is always this kind of uh, um, interesting um, conversation that we have about the rivalry between saints, right? Because my saint is better. My saint produces more miracles than yours. And it's always interesting because the class divides between students who are either uh, Jewish, Muslim, or Protestant who don't have that kind of background, and the Catholic students. Uh, because American Catholicism is apparently very much invested still in this kind of uh, uh, tifo da stadio when it comes to Catholic, uh, Catholic saints. Um, and so we talk about, obviously, the Greek etymology of Calogero, Kalos, and the Geron, a beautiful old man. Um, but what piques the student's interest uh, is, is another kind of aspect. Um, at, and here I'm quoting uh, the narrator. At the mention of San Calogero, the husband gave a small skeptical smile. The girl confided that as a child she had been afraid of San Calogero with his black face, black beard, and black cape and that it had been uh, her mother, rather than herself, who had made the vow, not that that made any difference. And so obviously that piques the interest of my students. And they say, wait a second, a black saint? And so that allows me to introduce a short history, very short history, of black Sicily, reminding students that Sicily, um, at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and, uh, and, and Africa obviously has a racially um, diverse history that often kind of is, is missing in their, uh, in their uh, landscape. And that then harkens back to the Council of Egypt, to uh, Jufa and Joha, um, and obviously even in the English translation, the title is kept in, uh, in, in, in Arabic. And so we talk about the kind of um, racialization of that Islamic um, um, Islamic past, um, the history of the Saracens, uh, the Moors, um, and uh, how this memory of Black Sicily uh, crosses religious boundaries uh, and survives in the Catholic iconography of Black saints and Mother Virgin figures. Uh, right, Sicily has a has a number of Black saints: Saint Benedict the Moor and the Black Madonna of, uh, of, of Tindari. Um, and so San Calogero kind of triggers that kind of uh, conversation. Um, and there are obviously also all, all kinds of other black figures, San Filippo Nero di Agira, the Black Christ in Siculiana. Um, and um, what, what's interesting at that point is I, I teach an essay by Vincenzo Consolo at the same time. I think we mentioned it uh, before. Uh, the English translation by uh, Norma Bouchard and, uh, and uh, Lollini. And then there is Consolo who uh, talks about um, what he calls his own accidental whiteness. Right? He says, I'm, I'm Sicilian, which means I'm white, but I'm white by accident. Um, and, um, and he talks really about uh, the um, 
the black saint uh, Benedict, uh, Saint Benedict the Moor, um, who uh, was a Franciscan friar and patron saint of, of Palermo. Um, Benedict was eventually placed as a patron saint of the Sicilian capital, an honor bestowed upon Santa Rosalia, who came from an aristocratic family. And so Consolo interprets this substitution, uh, both in terms of class conflict, a noble woman who takes the place of a former slave, but also suggests that the reasons for this replacement are tied to the racial politics and anxiety uh, about black masculinity uh, in the Inquisition. And so, according to Consul, a black male saint challenged the white male supremacy of the Inquisition and subverted political and religious hierarchies presented by the nobility and, um, and, and the church, which again ties into the Council of Egypt as, um, as, as well. And so, a more docile white female saint was more in line uh, with the ideology of, of church authorities at, um, at, at the time. Um, and so, and if, however, there is a place in Shasha that registers a convergence of the uh, Mediterranean myth and the American myth, there's obviously uh, the Long Crossing. And obviously, Teresa has uh, talked about it the other day. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm really always curious about the reaction of, of, of students and how um, they kind of tease out how um, relevant it is today, right? It's a story of deceit and human uh, trafficking in which crafty and unscrupulous smugglers, Sicilians themselves, take advantage of peasants who spent their life savings to buy a ticket to, um, to, to uh, America. And students, when I, I kind of talk about that kind of scene, right, that reminds me a little bit of also uh, Grazia Deledda's novels, right, that there is a, a thalassophobia of islanders, uh, a fear of the sea, as Shasha says, we kind of, uh, and, and I think the Leda, Grazia de Leda does that too, that the, the Sardinians are kind of looking inward, like away from, um, uh, from, uh, from the sea. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of go back to La Storia also, and, and, and that kind of interpretation of, of, of Shasha, um, and, and Shasha being, and that is so kind of interesting to my students because when we talk about the United States, we think of the United States as a country of immigration, right? What they often lack is what is left behind, right? What happened to the people who didn't come or didn't make it here? Um, and um, there is definitely a, something that I invite students to do when, when we read Shasha, and that is I ask them, what are the languages spoken in your family history? And I ask them, take a moment to think about that. Not the languages that you personally speak, but the languages spoken in your family history. And so I, I give them a little bit and they, they, they start thinking and sometimes they come up with very interesting language combinations that were spoken at some point in their family. Um, sometimes it's four or five. Uh, sometimes no language is remembered. Um, and so what we talk about is what happened in the meantime. Why did your ancestors speak Italian, Irish, Polish, uh, all kinds of you know languages? And now what, what happened with you? Um, and often they say, well, it's, we kind of stopped talking that language. And I say, well, that, that, what that means, however, is that at some point, um, some members in your family raised their children in a foreign language, in a language that was not their own. And so I invite him to think, what does it mean to raise your children in a language that you don't speak very well and that you don't have that kind of emotional investment uh, in, in, in it? You know, our native language, our mother tongue is the language of affection, is the language of love, the language of dreams. Um, and so there is an unspoken kind of linguistic trauma that we um, often ignore. And I tell them this is a story of all of us, right? Whether our ancestors came on a slave ship 
crossed the southern border uh, or went through Ellis Island, that kind of assimilation into a white Anglophone space uh, means that that kind of linguistic trauma is part of your family history and is what, in many ways, is bringing you um, over here uh, in, in this, um, in this, um, in, into this classroom. Um, and um, so Shasha, I explained to them, is one of the few, if not kind of the only one who really talks about this kind of Sicilian diaspora, right? There you have these authors, and in the story it is mentioned, you know, um, Verga doesn't, even though he is very interested in the United States, never really talks about that. Pirandello mentions it a little bit, maybe Capuana. Um, and so I invite them to see Shasha as kind of the breaker of a taboo in many, um, in, um, in many ways. Um, and I, and I, when I talk about the kind of black saints and that kind of black Sicily, I try to introduce a figure that sometimes is um, familiar for them, and that is Booker T. Washington. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. T Booker T. Washington, African-American intellectual, a contemporary um, of Frederick Douglass, who in 1912, and I want to go back to that time. 1912 is the time, is the year in which Pasquale Shasha comes to the United States. Uh, Booker T. Washington was born a slave, was illiterate, was freed, um, learned how to read and write. And so a, 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 a history that is kind of parallel to, um, to other uh, African-American intellectuals. And he writes a book uh, in, in 1912, The Man Farthest Down. And so he thinks about um, slavery and uh, African Americans, um, and then he takes this trip and he goes to Sicily. And he says, the Negro farmer has an advantage over the Italian peasant. If you ask a Sicilian workman why he does something in a certain way, he invariably replies, we've always done this uh, this way. The result is that while the Negro in Africa is learning to plow by steam, the Sicilian farmer is still using the same plow that was used by the Greeks in the days of Homer and Abraham. And his conclusion, uh, Booker T. Washington, again, who was born into slavery, comes to Sicily, and his conclusion is that the Sicilian peasant um, is the man farthest down. That uh, and I guess this is kind of an interesting um, reconstruction optimism uh, that is kind of shining through here. Uh, but Booker T. Washington saying the Sicilian peasant um, is in a condition uh, of subalternity um, that is even worse than the American slave or the American uh, ex-slave. And that kind of opens up a whole kind of set of kind of other discussions about the relationship of obviously um, how the Italians and how the Sicilians became white, right? And, I, and I'll tell them, you know, so I'm Sicilian, and I said, I present as a white male, enjoying all kind of attached privileges that come with that today. But as a hundred years ago, I was not white. And that surprises them. And so we kind of get to talk about the United States race via um, via uh, Shasha. Um, the other text um, that I find uh, kind of um, fascinating, and again, Teresa mentioned this, uh, the, um, in, in this kind of context of the Mediterranean and American myth in, in, in Shasha, I want to kind of, speaking of languages and languages that are spoke, languages that are um, invented new languages and, and languages that disappear. Um, and I want to kind of emphasize Shasha's um, very glottological kind of uh, view of um, the Italian American, right, in uh, La Zia, La Zia d'America, in particular Broccolino, uh, the Brooklyn variant, which is very uh, famous. And I um, when well, I emphasize that the variant is not Sicilian American uh, because due to a dialect, we call it dialect leveling, several dialects converge 
into that um, into that variant. And so um, it's always kind of interesting to explain to students, and here I'm kind of wearing my linguist hat, um, the kind of phonotactical and morphological kind of uh, adaptations. Uh, what does it mean to speak English, uh, an American English with an Italian accent? Why does that, you know, why does it sound the way it, um, it, uh, it sounds? And we talk about the fact that Italians kind of want to finish their words with a vowel. And if it isn't there, we add a demi-vowel. Um, and um, so I, I want to kind of uh, conclude here with that kind of question, what do American undergrads get out of Shasha, right? What, what does it mean to teach Shasha? And obviously, kind of, I've, I've mentioned things that are clear to us as, as researchers, um, but often I find myself, I have to kind of build up the kind of discussion from the ground up. Uh, because again, it is a different context and it is a different kind of um, kind of audience, right? Not only are we teaching, but I often find myself I have to convince my students that you know because their reaction is like, so what? Why would we read an obscure novelist uh, from a place that we've never been to that we don't know don't know about? And so again, it's that kind of translation strategy of domestication, showing how Shasha is relevant to them, even if they don't necessarily see it uh, uh, initially. But Shasha allows, in the um, American undergraduate uh, curriculum, allows me to discuss kind of the racial politics in the United States and in, uh, in, 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 in Italy. Um, it allows me to talk about privilege, it allows me to talk about translation, right? And I was so happy to see the kind of translators here. Uh, my background is in translation studies myself, and so I, you know, they're kind of my heroes. Um, and I kind of think of them, you know, being a translator is never a nine to five job, right? It's, it's those things that wake you up at night and you know, it's like, oh, I have, I've been thinking about this translation problem. And uh, in the middle of the night you go in and you take, take notes because otherwise in the morning you will, uh, you will forget. And so teaching Shasha is always this kind of grand effort uh, of, um, of um, translation. Right, a translation that involves um, all of us, right, in our translatio, in our movements back and forth uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salvatore. I think we were really lucky to be your students for 20 minutes. And so I really ask classmates if you have any question to the professor. I, I, I'm a, okay, I'm kidding, but in a way I'm, I'm completely honest be with you because uh, there was a great approach to put a student in a labyrinth in which at the end the red thread is always there, you know? That's what you are doing because the, every single labyrinth shows us that we are the way to find the exit, we are the, the compass that can decide where to go. And I think that's a very good pedagogical approach as we were discussing before thanks to your question. And so I think this is what we try every day in class to do. So thank you very much for your talk. For yeah. uh, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this compelling presentation. I was <laughs> jumping on my chair many times. Um, from like a, uh, let's say, technical perspective, you said you built from the ground up uh, so as to facilitate or enable your students to read Shasha. And so I was wondering very practically, what's your technique? So. Um, maybe you introduce and then uh, what do you do? Do you give them the reading at home with reading questions or do you read in class and then with, uh, with discussion activities or how do you uh, intertwine all of these elements of reading and then expanding and then going back to reading? I wanted to know a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, um, how do I teach? Uh, first of all, 
often I use maps, right? Things that we take for granted. If I say the Mediterranean, they often don't necessarily know, right? If I say Sicily as a crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa, they have to see it on a map, right? And I have to draw lines for them. So whenever I teach, you know, world literature classes have to have maps for American students. Um, that kind of visualization, I think, helps me. When it comes to um, the, I, there, there are two kind of approaches there, right? What, what I try not to do is to lecture too much, right? Because then it becomes boring and it, it isn't interactive. And so what I have are leading questions that are formulated as questions, but in reality kind of have a mini lecture embedded in them. Um, and so what then happens is that the leading question makes them kind of say the answer that I want them to say, and then it sounds like it's their idea. But since they have already formulated it, they have said it, all of a sudden it is their idea, and this is what they are um, kind of learning. Sometimes um, I uh, pick up a, uh, a small passage, right? And, and so we focus on a particular word or particular sentence, a particular paragraph. And so kind of um, spending a lot of time with that, and, and that is also how I kind of teach writing, right? How do you write about literature? Um, and I kind of try to model that and I say, you know, maybe we spent half an hour, 45, 50 minutes on, on a sentence, on sometimes an entire word. Can you replicate that in, uh, in, in, in writing? Um, and obviously, um, my pedagogy, I realize, has evolved over, over time and I feel such a dinosaur saying this because um, I'm, you know, i giovani, right? This is what you said, avanti giovani. But I've been teaching here for 16 years and the student population has definitely changed. Teaching today is very different from 10 or 12 years ago because the world is changing so quickly um, and because, again, things that we often take for granted, right? I mean, we were talking about it with, with uh, uh, Alessandro yesterday, you know, questions like democracy. Right? I, I find, sometimes find myself that I have to justify it in front of students. That, it, in fact, democracy is what we want, right? The democracy, a democratic order, is the best one in which to live. And again, I have never found myself in a position in which I had to kind of not only exp like kind of explain the democratic process to students, but actually also convince them that that's what we want. So it's it's a work in progress. Congratulations, first of all, it's really really inspiring. Now, on this last point that you said here, I my mind went to the, the situation uh, I've been told by by several friends about teaching Shasha in the French uh, context. Uh, you were referring, for example, to the religious side, and you said the Catholicism apropos of the, uh, of the novel of Shasha that you had to, to take into account that in your class you had different type of, uh, of religions. In, in the case of, of France, uh, there is this uh, uh, situation where to teach Shasha uh, in, uh, and for example, to say that democracy is necessarily the, 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 the most appropriate choice is a challenge by the students that uh, regard this not as an obvious thing, particularly in the, in the value side. So I, I just like to add this from the European side, an element that until a few, few years ago was taken as a, you know, was taken for granted that democracy was, was an obvious choice. Uh, so in America, is, <laughs> the Americas in France in this case. Certainly, I mean, I imagine it is kind of 
uh, question that other kind of teachers, professors face in other countries as well. Um, and and uh, the, the obviously the kind of right wing, the, the rise of fascism, the right wing ideologies uh, are happening all over the world from Brazil to Eastern Europe, you know, to, to you know, we'll see what happens this weekend, right? We're all kind of on the edge of our seats. Um, but um, the, uh, I, I would imagine, right, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the, the banlieue um, and the kind of um, interesting thing about teaching uh, in the United States, and that to me is always a challenge, especially at a public institution, is also that the students come from very different backgrounds um, in the sense that I introduce something and maybe a third of the class will be bored because they have heard of these things and they, they know these things. Um, one third um, is, and that is usually what, what happens, is um, they're very bright, very smart. Um, they do restore my faith in, in humanity, right? And, and the teaching is always kind of um, an extreme act of optimism. Um, and that often uh, they're very smart, they just haven't had exposure. To, to ideas, um, and a third uh, of, of the class sometimes is there just because it is a social expectation, uh, and, and they say so, uh, and they don't necessarily um, want to know about Chasha, um, and that's where my convincing kind of, you know, steps in, and, and, and kind of um, trying to explain you should care and this text also speaks to you and speaks to the kind of um, I don't really want to be here. Like, why, why is that? Um, and so, I, at least those are my challenges in, in, the, uh, in the classroom. And I, I, I imagine it's different in different institutions. Um, um, but yeah, they keep me on my toes. I, I like to, to remind that in 1965, Shasha wrote in the Lord at Palermo, an article about his uh, in, uh, Arab roots, and, uh, and as you said, you know, the, the name Shashen, the Zaksa, the Arabic part, and he said that uh, despite he felt deeply <laughs> Arab uh, in, in, the, in his sentiments, uh, he would have never reached the point of changing the the discourse sur la méthode of the